Good day, this is Jeff Rouse checking in from Our Story Studios. And look who stopped to see me, Blake. Hey, how you doing? From the Opera House. It's nice to, to see, see you. you again. Haven't seen you since we shot the show. Yeah, it's been a little bit, hasn't it? Yeah. Are you coming in to see if we can do this again sometime? Oh, I think we might as well, shouldn't oh, yeah, we? Absolutely. Great. We're going to plan on it, so we'll have to talk about that. Excellent. But we just got done shooting another show. Would you yeah. like to see it right now? Oh, my goodness, yeah. Well, let's check it out. Let's go. Well, joining me today is... Alice Struess. And Bill Bussey. Welcome both of you. Now, I know, Alice, you have a shop here in town called Mix, Mix Nuts Antiques. That's correct. Uh, can you tell us a little bit of your history and the history of the business? Okay. Uh, I guess I can say that I started an interest in antiques when I was, oh, in high school, my mother had a dresser that had been my grandmother's, and she decided that she was going to paint it. She didn't like it anymore, and I was horrified that she would paint <laughs> this beautiful, ornate oak dresser. And I said, I'll go to Buck's Furniture and buy you an unpainted piece, and you can paint, which she did. I also started dumpster diving before it was a fad <laughs> at that time because he found fabulous treasure. Then I did various um, things and in 2004 I bought the shop from Lori Hoffman. Okay, downtown Fairmont. D downtown Fairmont, uh, yes, mm -hmm. for old time's sake. and. Um, I changed the name to Mix Nuts, and we've evolved since there. And now, what is your location now? Our location now is 222 South Grant. We're across from Fairmont Ford. Okay, very cool, very cool. Uh, now, and how many vendors do you have in your store? I have 10 people who rent booths from me. Very cool. Mm -hmm. And one of the people that rents a booth from you is... Bill Bussey. Yes. So, You're right. Bill, tell us what, pe why people collect antiques or collectibles, for that matter. Well, people collect for different reasons. Some people, like myself, collect things that I remember from my childhood. Mm -hmm. Maybe, maybe my grandmother had them. Maybe the toys that were broken because there were so many boys at home, or um, things that you know they just hit you sometimes. Things go in and out of fashion. Sometimes you like things of a certain era, and sometimes you like something different. You sure. know, like Beanie Babies were big for a while. They weren't antiques, but they were big. And glassware, you know, was big for a while. But, you know, I collect records, books, that kind of thing. So that's the kind that's of things I interest. like to have in my, my space. Your interest. Yeah. Alice? What, do you collect anything in particular yourself? <laughs> or everything? <laughs> Some people think that I do collect everything because I have a storage unit, I have a barn, and I have a, shop. a basement, and the shop. That's true. But no, I guess if I was going to narrow it down that um, I like pr um, primitives and then um, items that reflect Fairmont. As you both know, some people collect antiques and some people are just collectors, right? right. I mean, there's, there's all different kinds of tastes. Well, we have uh, something here. It's an episode of Hometown Focus where Al Travis, it came out in 2001, Al Travis interviewed a number of collectors from our area. Uh, and the first one we would like to show the folks is a young man who made miniature farms, the whole setup of the farm. It's really cool. Would you like to see that? Sure. Yeah, certainly. Let's take a look. As we mentioned, our show this week is on collections, and our first story is uh, with Chris Burmeister, who does model farms. You might think to yourself, model farms? What is that? No, it's not farms that have been airbrushed or have sterling white teeth. They're little short miniature farms. We'll talk about that and see that next. <laughs> Chris Burmeister, veteran collector of farm implements. Well, my grandfather got me started probably when I was two because I had seen a toy tractor at a doctor's office in Esterville and had wanted to 
cried till he finally got it for me for Christmas. But Chris did more than just put his collection pieces on a shelf. He started turning them into displays. Basically, I got started out a few gifts at Christmas time, and over the years, either took stuff and set uh, little farms in the house. And this is before they even had anything that the kids can go out and buy now. You had to make it yourself. So mom and dad would save pop cans and cardboard boxes and sticks and whatever to make little farm setups. Chris started taking his displays to shows back in 1988. By 1990, he'd already won first place at a show in Olivia and immediately started getting invites to all kinds of competitions. It takes artistic ability, building skills, and loads of patience to create award-winning displays. And as Chris explains, it all starts with finding a real farm to recreate and a keen eye for detail. And he'd ask the homeowner, can I take a look at that? And then he would take pictures of whatever building and you'd climb inside of it, in and out, and then you would uh, break down everything you can think of. Chris says local stores, such as Carlson Hobbies and Crafts, carry many of the supplies he needs. If he can't find it, he can usually order it out of a specialty catalog. Most of the vehicles and implements are custom-built or collectibles. Only the best for a pastime that has grown tremendously over the past 20 years. According to Chris, some shows, such as the Nationals in Dyersville, Iowa, can fill an entire school. Like Dyersville, there'd be people from all over the states and Canada and overseas would come to this. Okay. It's a big thing over in Europe and mm -hmm. other countries, too. Chris's philosophy about collections is simple. Make it worth it. There's some collectors that they go out and they'll buy practically everything that's brand new out of the box and have rolls and rolls and a lot of mine I, the last couple of years got it set so it's stuff that is used on a display or it's certain collectors items it's a satisfying sideline for Chris, who doesn't make much money from the display shows. He recently finished a year-long project, the Frank Milo Farm. This one is not at any show or on public display anywhere, but sits in a special place at its namesake's residence. It's sitting on a bed in the upstairs bedroom out in the farmhouse, and he's going to give it to his grandkids someday. For Hometown Focus, I'm Kathy Evangelista. Well, I should also mention that Chris not only is a great uh, model farmer, but he is also the owner of a siding business, and they specialize in siding that's about, you know, about this big and about that long and perfect on your model farm. Wow, was that impressive? That Very certainly much. was. That young man has some talent. That I mean, he does. And the time he invests in those farm setups, I was just so impressed. And talking about people that are collectors and different things, I have to confess Yes, I too am a collector, <laughs> and uh, mostly of God knows, you know, uh, uh, unbelievable <laughs> stuff I've right. ran through. It's everywhere. And, <laughs> and uh, in, in 2000, and I think it was 2003, Hometown Focus, when they were doing this segment about collectors, asked me to talk a little bit about my collection of Laserdisc movies. Let's take a look. Uh, we've got uh, our... Uh Movie review with Jeff Rouse, a little bit different take this week. He's going to talk about collections and then some. This show is about collections and collectibles. Uh, if you know myself or my wife, we're both serious collectors and collect a lot of things. But what I want to talk about today that I've collected in the 80s were laser discs. Laser discs are movies, kind of like a, a CD, um, a D, what's that, D, DVD that's out now, but they're the full size of an album like such. What was nice about these were they did a lot of things in the 80s that you couldn't get. They have a lot of information on them. They show the trailers. They show scripts. Uh, they have additional photographs, and they also a lot of times have soundtracks to show uh, the making of the film and some of the things that went wrong. I'm going to show you now a clip of one of these so you can see exactly how a laser disc can be fun. Most people weep with joy at the ending of this film. The rather sentimental idea that an angel somewhere has gotten its wings that is represented by the ring of the bell is well accepted by viewers who've invested two hours and nine minutes in this story of George Bailey. So that's some of the advantages of having a laser desk. Now, laser desk, sounds like a good idea, right? Wrong. Died in the 80s, not a good thing. There's obsolete now as an 8-track. This is totally a worthless collection.
I bought them because I thought, this will be fun. I'll be on the cutting edge. I am not on the cutting edge. I have a collection of virtually worthless laser disc machine, uh, laser disc movies. Now I do have a, a laser disc machine. Of course you need a special machine just to watch them. As long as that lasts, I will enjoy my laser disc. When that gives out, guess what? Once again, I have a worthless collection of laser disc movies, over 200 of them. When my laser disc machine gives out, I'll have some beautiful, beautiful covers and some frisbees if you need a lot of frisbees. So that tells you to be careful when you're collecting because sometimes best intentions don't work out. Well, there's my collection. Pretty, pretty impressive. Pretty impressive, yes. <laughs> and, and you, you watch them all. I still watch them. I still watch them. My laser disc machine still works. I still use it. What I found most interesting in that old interview is a couple different things. First of all, did I not know what DVDs were? I couldn't, I mispronounced DVD, but I'd like to think it was new at the time, but I don't know that it was. I don't know what I was talking about. And it's blatantly obvious why I got into TV after that kind of a performance. <laughs> Impressive. Anyway, Alice, on a more serious note, tell us a little bit. I see you brought some things with you. Tell us about some of the objects that, that we can find at Mixed Nuts and some of the ones you brought with us. Oh, okay. We have quite a diverse um, group of items there. One of the things that I wanted to show was a Victorian tray that um, depicts... Um, the times and what Victorians liked to do was to put the children on a lot of their items. Cool. And they used a, a lot of, of metal for like the trays for um, children's watering cans. and. Alice, what year would that have been roughly? Um, this year probably looking at the late 1800s, early wow. 1900s. That's yes. pretty cool. Mm -hmm. Pretty cool. And then I brought an item that I picked up out, um, out in Cape Cod. And it is um, something that is, there again, very highly collectible. Um, people like is tins, and the reason they like them is because of the graphics that are on them. Sure. And this one is Campfire Marshmallows. And what's unique about this is the size because usually the tin is of a larger Large. variety. What year would you think something like that would be um, roughly? This you're probably looking at, oh, probably 1930, 1920s, okay. 1930. Okay, very cool, very Okay. Cool. And then I just happened to pick up, before I left, a Fairmont um, special high school composition book. Really? And it what it says on it, number um, 120, and it was made especially for H.H. H. Canwright. And it is, she dates it, and it's 1930. Wow. And I did have in the store, at, with that, also a, um, a binder that said Fairmont High School. You were given those. And of course, it's from the old junior high. Sure, mm -hmm. very cool. And the last item that I bought was, and this is from the late 1800s, and this is a grain sifter. And people like um, these just because of the um, decorative purpose to hang on the wall. So a lot of these people, do they, they use some of this stuff for repurposing and different things? Um, yes, they do. Mm -hmm. Much to your but, chagrin. <laughs> 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 you know, remember I said about baking, oh, that's, right. <laughs> that's just me. <laughs> but no, um, a lot of them use it. They put it on the wall, they set it on their table, you know. Very cool. And put a display in. Great items. Very impressive. <laughs> and I'm sure collectors love it. And, uh, you know, speaking of collectors... There is uh, an, another story that was done in the same episode, done in 2001, 
that featured uh, a collection of from here in town that somebody has that's very unique, and that is uh, uh, John Larson, who has jukebox collection. Are you familiar with John's collection? Oh, yes. I mean, yeah, it's yeah. really impressive. Right. And this story was done, like I was saying, in 2001, so we want to show the folks. And right after that, uh, then they talk about some of the collections that are in the museum and uh, uh, talk to Lenny about the collections that are in the museum. Why don't we show the folks that right now? Okay. As far as uh, what Kathy did this week, because she's not here, she got one interview in before she got sick, and that was with John Larson about one of his favorite collections. <laughs> Well, I'm here at the home of John Larson. He lives in Fairmont, and he's got quite a, a few different collections, but one we've been kind of talking about before, we always wanted to get um, on Hometown Focus, was his jukebox collection, as you can see, and he's got some lovely, lovely jukeboxes. Tell me when you got started on all this, John. Um, I probably got started uh, back in the late 70s. Mm -hmm. um, actually, I was collecting uh, big old radios back then and I always liked all the lights on it but I never could find a radio that had enough lights on it mm -hmm. and uh, then I saw these old Wurlitzers from the from the 1940s mm -hmm. and uh, I figured that's that's really what I was looking for mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, but I started uh, I think I got the first jukebox about 1984 mm -hmm. actually we got two of them at that point and uh, we've collected uh, several in the meantime. Mm -hmm. And you, um, you you put them in all parts of your house, don't you? I mean, you have them wherever they sort of f fill a void in the room or, or kind of fit the decor. How do you how do you decorate your house with those? <laughs> well, um, my wife will tell you that they're like big refrigerators. <laughs> and they are. They weigh about 400 pounds and they take up about as much room as a refrigerator. Mm -hmm. So uh, fortunately, we do have uh, some space here that we can uh, uh, put the jukeboxes in, in different mm -hmm. spots. And uh, actually, when we bought the first two, mm -hmm. uh, we didn't have enough room for them. It was the original house that we had built, mm -hmm. and we had to add a room on for the uh, for this jukebox because <laughs> it was so large. It was one of them upstairs, and it's, uh, it was the the Peacock model. It's the largest jukebox that Whirlers has ever made, and it stands mm -hmm. about this tall. So we had to have space for it. But uh, we kind of put them in the recreation room, and uh, we have a sunroom that we have one, and we put them in different spots of the house, mm -hmm. and you kind of. Uh, get used to them after a while. Some people, <laughs> when they see them, they look kind of strange, you know, having a jukebox in your house, more or less mm -hmm. five or six of them. Uh, uh -huh. But uh, we find spots for them. Um, they're beautiful. I don't see, I mean, they're just, they're, they're gorgeous pieces, pieces of furniture. And I say, if, you, um, if you've added a room on for one, you've, you've made a commitment to them, haven't you? Yes, they are. Uh, they're a nice size for a, for a recreation room. Um, they are a, really a piece of art mm -hmm. from uh, Art Deco. A lot of the styling is very Art Deco, mm -hmm. but they were made uh, back in the 40s, and, and they were actually uh, kind of a disposable item because this this particular one is a Model 1100 Wurlitzer, and it was made in 1949. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, once these jukeboxes were out on location uh, for the year, mm -hmm. and the new models came out, then this jukebox would either go back to the factory and be destroyed. A lot of them were actually, they broke them up for scrap metal mm -hmm. and the new models would come in. So the more, um, the more um, um, uh, disposable an item is, obviously the more collectible it becomes in later years, right? Is that, is that, am I, is that a good judgment, assessment? Um, yeah, I think, uh, and especially uh, we have one upstairs that's, that's quite rare, the, the 850, mm -hmm. and they only made about uh, 10,000 of those, mm -hmm. and not too many of those are left. So they're, you know, they're quite collectible. Mm -hmm. This one, uh, for some reason, it wasn't a very successful jukebox. It's, it's very modern. It has kind of a military uh, bomber nose on it here. Mm -hmm. It looks like the front end of an uh, airplane from that era. Mm -hmm. But some of these weren't very popular and uh, there's quite a few of these around though, the 1100s. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now this one in particular um, right now can't can't play any music. It's got a little audio problem, but you do have, most of yours do play, and you do play them quite often. And I wanted to, I wanted to give the viewers a little listen into one of them. Which one are we going to listen to? Well, I'd say we probably listen to the Model 1015 just out in the other room here. Mm -hmm. And the uh, 1015 was made in 1946 and 1947. And it was the, they called it the bubbler, and it was the most popular jukebox they ever made. They made about 56,000 jukeboxes. And it's a real nice size. It's got uh, uh, bubble tubes on it, and uh, it's a really uh, very interesting jukebox to have in your home because it is so colorful and there's so much motion to it and action going on here. So that would probably be a good one to, uh -huh. to listen to. Yeah, fun to listen to and fun to watch. So let's listen in for just a second here. <laughs> Sweet 
Sounds good, doesn't it? It's it is. It's fun to have these in your house, isn't it? Do you have a um, Do you have a favorite at this point? A favorite jukebox? Yeah. Um, probably the Peacock upstairs, mm -hmm. and uh, it's it's my favorite, I guess, because it's it's quite large and it has. Um, if you see on the pictures there, it has uh, uh, colored plastics that go up almost all the way back on the cabinet, and they wrap around in there. It's just quite an ornate jukebox. Mm -hmm. Also, it has. Um, polarized film. There's uh, two peacocks uh, in the bottom of the uh, jukebox area there that uh, that actually change color. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's quite an interesting system. I could talk to you for an hour on the, <laughs> the polarizing system that yeah. this jukebox has, but it uh, basically it, uh, it it's kind of a rainbow of colors behind this uh, male and female peacock. Sure. It's gorgeous. It's gorgeous. And now you see a lot of our B-roll is taken in the evening because um, you had even described these. I love how you described them. They're kind of creatures of the night. They really look beautiful in the evening and at, at night, don't they? Yes. Uh, the um, the, uh, the plastics, you know, the, the backlit plastics and everything are uh, really quite... Uh, uh, bright at in the evening, but uh, during the day you you know you can't see them very well. Mm -hmm. But uh, all the lighting and everything was designed mm -hmm. uh, for you know for use in the evening. Mm -hmm. In fact, all the um, uh, starting in uh, the mid or late 1930s, uh, there was a man by the name of Paul Fuller that worked mm -hmm. for Wurlitzer, and he personally designed all of these jukeboxes. Mm -hmm. And if you put pictures of them in a row, you can see how he got an idea for something and then uh, next year he kind of expanded on that idea mm -hmm. but he uh, they say he designed these in a dark office uh, that he would uh, he would actually design these uh, mm -hmm. you know so that he could see what the lighting effects would be yeah okay, that's great and um, now you're collecting around here is it tough to collect jukeboxes in this area or and then briefly now tell me do you have to really travel a lot or can you find what you need in uh, you know in the surrounding communities um, the older jukeboxes like the collectible the jukeboxes from the 40s, they call those the classic, mm -hmm. uh, the golden era jukeboxes. Th those are the very colorful ones with the wood case, mm -hmm. uh, the plastic, the backlit plastics. Mm -hmm. uh, those are pretty hard to find nowadays. Mm -hmm. Although I did find this one at an auction in Fairmont about mm -hmm. 20 years ago, mm -hmm. believe it or not. Yeah. Uh, but most of the jukeboxes nowadays are, uh, uh, you'll find the, the ones from the 50s and 60s and on up. Mm -hmm. But the older ones, uh, they're pretty hard to come by. Mm -hmm. you, you don't normally find them at an auction. Mm -hmm. So you got to do a lot of research. Um, John's got a lot of books on these. You got to be willing to do a little traveling. This isn't probably the easiest collection to get going on, but certainly a beautiful one. And I, we'd like to thank you so much for sharing it with us, John. And uh, again, uh, they are gorgeous. So if you ever get a chance to, to buy one or at least just go and see somebody, it's like John's, you have to invite you in. Go take a look because they are gorgeous and they're fun to listen to, too. Thanks again, John. Well, here at Hometown Focus, wouldn't be complete if we didn't take a look at another uh, community report, and this one about the history of some collections with Lenny. Hi, this is Lenny Tweeden. I'm at the Pioneer Museum. And this week's history lesson is on uh, collections. And really, when you think about it, a museum is a collection of collections. So, we'll take a little tour of the museum and look at some of the different collections we have. Not all of them, but uh, take a look at a few. One of the ones that we have is uh, an egg collection. This was done by Archie Whitman. He started the collection in 1914, and it took him another 20 years before he finally got it completed. Uh, there's also a collection of uh, papers and newspaper clippings of Interlock and Park. Martin County Businesses, 3M, Railway Motors, and the Fairmont Canning Company have a collection of pictures, photos, and a number of different things from their businesses. If you look around the museum, you'll notice on the wall and standing on the floor, there are some large clocks. There are actually 12 of those clocks located uh, on the three floors in the museum. We have a, a board uh, as you walk in the museum with pictures of unknown people. They've just been brought in. People have put the pictures on this board, and most of them are unidentified. There are a few that are identified, however. There's a display case with sports memorabilia. There's a baseball glove, football helmet, um, uh, horseshoes, a catcher's mask and mitt, and a number of other things uh, dealing with sports. As we go over to the Brote Room, this is a collection of research materials. Newspapers, photo file, history file. The military room has a number of different things, including Indian artifacts. Some of the military collections are uniforms, uh, weapons, uh, bullets, grenades, ration kits, uh, radios, helmets. Indian artifacts include uh, arrowheads, moccasins, and tomahawks. 
From there, you can go to the Pioneer Home. You might imagine what kind of collections that would be there. There's collections from the home. Uh, there are kitchen collections, all sorts of different kinds of uh, dishes, uh, stoves. There's furniture and clothing, plus a lot of other things. When you go upstairs in the museum, in the schoolroom, of course, you're going to find collections of student desks, musical instruments, school bells, lunch pails, yearbooks, graduation programs, and band equipment. The welcome room has a collection of women's hats, women's clothing, children's clothing, doilies, tablecloths, and also there's a collection of eyeglasses. When you go into the hunt room, you'll find some uh, interesting things that are collections of medical and dental uh, items. There's also a collection of pictures of pioneer doctors. There's a wheelchair, amputation sets, a dental chair, a drill, cabinet, x-ray machine. Also in the hunt room, there's a William Budd collection. That's a collection of pictures of the Budd home. Uh, there's the Budd vineyard. There's a perpetual calendar, plus quite a few different carpentry tools that uh, William Budd had. Between these rooms in the hallway, there's a gun collection. All sorts of different kinds of guns. Uh, some of these are from the Civil War. Downstairs in what's going to be the Walter Carlson room, there's a collection of transportation items. There's automobiles, buggies, sled, bicycle, and a motorcycle. There's an ag room, and we have miscellaneous items like flags, cameras, typewriters, and wire rim glasses. These are some of the collections we have at the Pioneer Museum. We'll probably have a collection that would interest you. Feel free to stop down and see us anytime, Monday through Thursday, 8.30 to 4.30, Friday and Saturday in the afternoons. For Hometown Focus, this is Lenny Tweeden. Wow, they have some impressive items at that museum here in our town, don't they? That they Many do. of them. Great Very collections. cool. I mean, it's impressive as heck. And how about uh, John Larson's... Uh, Jukebox. Give me one. Absolutely. <laughs> I want one too. Those are just absolutely so cool. Uh, so, Bill, tell us about some other items that the two of you brought from the store. Well, I brought a couple of things because at last count, I had 1,800 books at, that, at the store. It makes nuts. And I have a lot of uh, juvenile series books like this. I have all the Hardy Boys. All the Nancy Drew. <laughs> <laughs> and these are all in the store? Yes. Even the Bobsy Twins. And there are many, many other series books. These are maybe among the best known. Sure. But some of the ones that are lesser known are actually more interesting than these. Very cool. Like there's a Judy Bolton series that we both think is more interesting than Nancy Drew. <laughs> <laughs> so now, let me ask you before you show us some other things. Alice. Uh, when people come in the shop, uh, like these books, are, yeah. are they mostly looking for certain things? Or are they shoppers who go, oh my gosh, look at that? I could tell you that the majority of people walk in, and first of all, they're amazed at the amount of items that we have in the store. And the other thing is, is they like the diversity. With having 10 different dealers in there, each one of us, um, is attracted to and buys certain items. Sure. We aren't strictly per, uh, pure antiques, or we do have collectibles. Bill has his books. Mm -hmm. So each one, correct me if I'm wrong, each one of the booths specializes in what, what Pretty, that person... What, uh, what they like. Like and in, are into... Uh, right. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. uh, like yourself. Yeah. And sometimes we have a problem of shopping in our own <laughs> We're our best we, customers, right. <laughs> we, can't, we bring something in and then we think, oh, gee, you I know. I think I better keep that. <laughs> and see, I'm into books, mm -hmm. but I'm also into... Albums. Records. <laughs> and I'm so I, I have a lot of the rock stuff from the sure. 60s, 70s, 80s, which people are into now. Absolutely. And it's a lot cheaper than buying the new pressings. <laughs> But I have a lot of others. Well, right and the too. album art, I've always well, thought it's is the absolutely art. incredible. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and uh, speaking of albums and such, uh, Bill, I know somebody that has about 200 Laserdisc movies that you might have to, <laughs> <laughs> have to take off my hands. What do you think? Well, I know somebody, Jeff, that has like 15,045s. Are you interested? Uh, <laughs> you keep yours, I'll keep mine. I think that would be good. So, awesome. Okay, Alice and Bill, now I have to ask. The name of the store is? Mixed, Mixed Nuts. <laughs> How in the world did that come about? I asked fearfully. 
Uh, well, truthfully, I was sitting with the dealers and everyone was giving me all these lists of names that of things that we could call the store and all of them sounded, you know, good, but they just didn't come right. And I was looking at this book that my daughter had given my husband and it was all about little anecdotes about your crazy Uncle Harry and your <laughs> <laughs> ever. And the name of the book was Mixed Nuts. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> and I said, that's it. <laughs> right. And when I'm working and new people come in and they want to know what the name of the place is for the checks, sure. I say, it's Mixed Nuts because of the people that work here. <laughs> right. So it works from the beginning and still extends right. into the, all, the, all the dealers. Right. <laughs> so cool. I think they'd all agree, too. <laughs> Absolutely. So now, uh, tell us... Uh, uh, as far as your hours and stuff, is all that on Facebook? Can you find all that? You have a Facebook account, yes. I'm sure. Yes, we do have a Facebook page, and I also am on Google. Okay. So that um, I know I get a lot of uh, calls from people who say they're on the interstate. We Googled antique stores in Fairmont. And Yours there you were. Up. Yep. There you were. How do we get there? So it's a it's a great shop, and, and we usually say use your GPS. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely, That's, that makes it easy now. When I'm on the yeah. road and I want to find a place, boom, there it yeah, is. Yeah. It's just very cool. So uh, we're going to recommend that people like you on Facebook, and Thank I'm you. sure you put a lot of different things on. Uh, yes, periodically as far as yep. new things coming in and uh, we want to thank you I want to thank you for uh, joining us today on Martin County on TV this has been great fun Alice it was fun Fred. Bill have fun with your laser discs yes thank you <laughs> wasn't that great Blake? it was fantastic some great reports some great stories love showing those yeah so it was very good fun well, uh, you know what? It's been great seeing you. Yeah. And, uh, you know, stop by any time. Absolutely. have you any time at all. We want to thank you, our viewers, for watching. And as we share with you the sponsors that made the show possible, remember, it's not just the past, but the present that tells our story.